I do want to um, bring you in, Congressman, but I, I just want to reread and, and recap for you and for our viewers what we're covering. The news that broke in the Washington Post that the Biden White House is now leaning toward turning over against the ex-president Donald Trump's wishes information to Congress about what the former president and his aides were doing during the insurrection. It's a move that the Post describes as a decision that could have significant political and legal ramifications. Our friend Yamiche um, put a finer point on it, said it will be the legal and political showdown to end all legal and political showdowns. Um, it, it does suggest two things. One, that we will know that it is knowable and we will learn what Donald Trump and his aides were doing. And two, this White House is responsive to congressional investigations. Well, it's about time. And I think that the American public should care that we know the truth. That's it. It's pretty simple. Let the facts come out. Uh, and if the president and Kevin McCarthy and other members of Congress uh, were involved in inciting or encouraging a violent attack on the Capitol, I think we should we should know that. And if if they weren't, we'll know that, too. But I do think that it's important that that this special committee get all the information about a, a, a completely unprecedented attack on our Capitol. And the American public should want that. Congressman, you know, Tim has made the point that so much of this happened in full view. I mean, Mike Pence was harassed by Donald Trump in full view. We want Mike to do the right thing. Um, members of Congress were threatened in full view. We like some more than others. Um, violence was... Um, encouraged by Mike Flynn and Rudy Giuliani, who talked about combat. Um, I wonder, with so much in full view, where you think the fervor comes from to keep secret their conversations with Donald Trump? Well, that's a great point, right? The real danger here is, is not that we don't know what happened. It's that we know what happened and there's no outrage, or that the other side simply tries to pass it off as normal behavior. Uh, that wasn't true in Watergate, by the way. I think Richard Nixon knew that when his conversations were revealed, the gig was up. He bought into the basic moral framework. Here, the president has always denied it. You're right. We already have out in the open uh, outrageous conduct, inciting a violent insurrection, uh, insurrection against the Capitol. There's really no serious debate about that. Denying the results of the election, trying to flip the results in places like Georgia and others. But let's know the details, too. And let's know who on Capitol Hill was involved in it. And let's know if they weren't. That's fair. But I think you're going to, there's a reason why they're so uh, freaked out about their conduct and their actions being revealed on that terrible day. I want to put up a list of some of the names that have been um, proposed, uh, some by members of Congress, some by, by, by media folks, some who've just um, stepped on their own tongues in interviews. Um, I'm looking at you, Mr. Jordan. This is uh, a partial list of people who might be of interest who have copped already to talking to Donald Trump. Uh, before, during, or after the insurrection. It's one Kevin McCarthy, one Jim Jordan, Greg Pence, Mo Brooks, Mike Lee in the Senate, and Tommy Tuberville, also in the United States Senate. We've learned from reporting in Peril by Bob Woodward and, and Robert Costa that Ted Cruz and Mike Lee looked at some of Donald Trump's fraudulent claims of a stolen election and found nothing there. Um, we've also learned that Lindsey Graham was actively involved, I believe he's under investigation in Georgia, for getting involved in states that he doesn't represent to push Donald Trump's complaints and concerns about a stolen election. How vast should this investigation be if we're talking about a conspiracy to plot a coup, which is what Adam Kinzinger described it as this week? Right. Well, let's just get the facts, right? I don't think we need to get ahead of ourselves. But look, I was there. I was on the House floor. I was in that undisclosed location with a bunch of Republicans who were, one in particular, who was gleeful at what was transpiring uh, outside. It took me a minute to understand why she was having such a good time. But I saw it. I saw it with her staff who caught up with her. They were excited about what was going on. They had been at the White House, I believe, the day before, talking about uh, what was going to happen. I mean, it's not really a mystery when Mo Brooks is down at the rally, you know, whipping up the crowd and pointing them towards the Capitol with a, I believe, with a bulletproof vest on. So, look, you're right. A lot of this is right out in the open. But I do think it matters uh, that we know exactly what Kevin McCarthy was doing, exactly what Jim Jordan was doing, and others who were in communication with the president that day. Because what he knew, when he knew it, 
uh, whether he failed to take action to respond, meaning to get help to the Capitol, whether he delayed that action, those are very important facts. And, and, and history should know them, and we should know them. And I think it matters. So let's, let's just get the truth. Congressman, who was the gleeful uh, Republican member of Congress? Well, I, I, I don't want to say, but her initials are Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, gle gleeful is, um, is, is yes, yes. <laughs> to hear, to I hear. Mean, it was, it was, I, I'll tell you what, what struck me that day is they weren't wearing masks. And we were still in a pre-vaccination yeah. uh, time. And I thought it was crazy and irresponsible. And there were Democratic members trying to give them masks and they were refusing. And it took me a minute to realize that actually what, was, what, was, what I was really noticing was why they were having a good time. And I think that I'm look, I'm I'm reading into their reading into their their behavior. But it, it seemed to me like they were enjoying what was happening. And when they reunited with some of their staff and some of the people who they had been separated from, uh, it was clear to me that they were they were they were happy in a way that made no sense, given the tragedy that was unfolding. Do you have any theories on why Kevin McCarthy wouldn't um willingly go and cooperate and maybe say, oh, I'll only talk to Liz and Adam, um, but sure, I'm happy. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm happy to tell you what I know. Why not, for the good of the institution, just cooperate and answer the questions? Does, do you think he has some real concerns about his role? Look, we, we all know what's going on, which is that Kevin McCarthy has taken a cowardly path. Uh, there was about five seconds, you'll recall, after the insurrection when he called it for what it was. Uh, and then he went right back into hugging uh, Donald Trump because he's making a cynical and cowardly political calculation that only by hugging Donald Trump and excusing this extraordinarily damaging and hateful conduct, this dangerous conduct, a bunch of cops have lost their lives, let's remember, and, and hundreds of them were in a four-hour fist fight with a bunch of thugs who came up here. Uh, but he's going to look the other way because that's in his political interest to do so. Uh, that's one of the most cynical and despicable things I've ever seen in politics. And, and, and that's, the, that's what the real motivation is. But I think the facts and the, the, the details matter, too. What, what, what was he saying to the president that day? What was Jim Jordan saying to the president that day? Uh, were they actually encouraging this behavior? Were they, were they downplaying it? Were they delaying the response that we needed in those critical moments? Uh, and if not, they shouldn't mind uh, answering the questions. Is there anything that you've seen since January 6th that leads you to believe that these associations, the New York Times has reported on a half a dozen interactions and associations, and I believe some members are proud of them, with the same extremist groups that the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security warns um, could be primed for domestic violence. Um, do you have any concerns that the White House looking the other way here now, you know, seven, eight, nine months post January 6th has made that threat more dire? I, I think the Justice Department and the administration are taking this very seriously. Uh, they are methodically prosecuting hundreds of individuals who are involved. Uh, we are making a priority, and the administration is, uh, of the threat we face from violent domestic extremism, which we've been told by the professionals is the most serious threat to us right now, even greater than foreign terrorism. Uh, and those of us who are old enough to remember the bombing in Oklahoma City or other acts of domestic terrorism by Americans uh, that were motivated by the same white supremacist or, or, or militia group uh, style activities uh, can be extremely dangerous. And so we have to take these warnings seriously because lives may very well be at stake. And I, I do think the administration is doing that, but this is part of it. We need to build the historic record and we need to understand what we're up against.